this summer, renowned foodie Hilary Biller is on a mission to reinvent the South African braai. It's out with the chops and force and in with the gourmet grill. She's bringing fresh ideas and full-on flavour. After 12 years as Angela Day and now food editor of the Sunday Times, Hilary knows what's hot in the world of food. And in a brand new cookbook, she's brought the braai to life. From Asian-inspired ribs to Mexican magic on the grill and kebabs with local flair, this is the place to be for all the inspiration you need to make your summer sizzle. The Mexicans do summer fiesta so well. Bold colors, wonderful flavors, lots of chili. And today my Mexican-inspired feast has a fajita with a fresh guacamole and a wonderful salsa on the side, followed by griddled corn topped with cheese that melts beautifully and a sprinkling of chili. There must be some heat on this. And then the star of the show is dessert, which is a trelech cake, which is a three milk special Mexican cake. I'm going to start off with dessert, which is a trelech cake. It's a wonderful sponge soaked with three different types of milk gooey, delicious. And the ingredients are eggs, sugar, flour, milk, baking powder and salt, vanilla essence, and of course not forgetting the decoration for the top, which are some beautiful maraschino cherries. The first thing is to separate five extra large eggs. I always prefer eggs that are at room temperature. My way of doing it is to put the egg in my hand and with quite a heavy knife, you holding it down so the yolk sort of sinks to the bottom of the egg. You crack it in the middle, but with a firm sort of crack. I'm going to put the whites in this bowl. It's important that you don't get any yolk mixed up with the white because that prevents it from whipping up nicely and that's what you want it to do. You want that lovely sort of meringue mixture with a lot of puff in it. I have three quarters of sugar here and I've saved one quarter which I'm going to mix up with the egg whites. Mix that in straight away and using an electric beater, it's whipped up into a lovely cream mixture. It's beautifully light in colour, that's an indication that it's ready and your mixer will leave a trail as you can see on the top of the mixture, then you know it's been whipped sufficiently. Add some flour, the baking powder and salt, which gives it that lovely rise, some milk, and lastly, a spoonful of vanilla essence. I always use a cap. I think that's a perfect measurement. Mix the ingredients together till it's smooth and creamy. I'm using a spatula for this, which I find is the easiest. I'm not using the electric beater because I don't want to incorporate any more air into the mixture. In whipping up the egg work, ensure the beater is really clean and dry. This will ensure that the eggs whip up beautifully and hold their shape so nicely. Whipping up egg whites, there are three different stages. This is the foamy stage, then it becomes firm, and then the third stage is where you've overbeaten it and you'll see that the egg white separates and a liquid comes away from it. That's the stage you really don't want. I'm going to start adding the sugar and then carry on beating to give it like a meringue consistency. A beautiful soft meringue. Now this isn't the one that you test by turning the bowl upside down over your head. It's too soft and you'll be covered in meringue. Add that to the cream mixture that I prepared earlier and using a spatula fold it through until it's well blended. I'm using a figure of eight movement. This way you don't whack out all that air that you've incorporated into the meringue and you keep that in the mixture almost well blended, can see no traces of meringue, 
and just right to be poured into my baking tin. I baselined my baking pan by tracing the base on a piece of baking paper, cutting it out and laying it flat in the pan. Before you line the base with paper, it's always a good idea to use some cooking spray. I find this way the paper holds down nice and securely on the base and then spray the sides. The batter is poured into the pan, beautifully creamy and rich yellow. It looks so yummy. And this bakes at 180 degrees for 50 to 60 minutes. This is one that was made earlier and has cooled completely. Turn it out onto a dish that is quite deep because you want the sauce, which is quite juicy, to be able to be kept on the plate. Peel off the baseline paper. For the sauce, that's the trelech part of the cake. It's three different types of milk. There's condensed milk, there's cream, and evaporated milk, which are all combined together. At this point, it's important to prick the cake with either a fork or a kebab stick. This way the cake absorbs all that lovely milk. Prick it quite a lot because there's a lot of milk that needs to be soaked up by the cake. And you don't have to worry because the cream goes over the top so it covers all those nasty little holes. Okay, I think that's perfect. The sauce is poured over can do it slowly so it has time to absorb into the cake. It's looking good, rich and creamy. Let the sauce run down the sides. There's a large volume of sauce, so don't panic. And you could take a spoon and scoop up the extra sauce on the side and pouring it back over the top of the cake. Clearly this isn't something that you'd have when you're on diet. Or don't feed it to diabetics, there's a lot of sugar in this. The cream is whipped till it's really stiff. If you find that the cream won't whip up, just add some sugar. The cream is perfect. You don't want it to be too stiff, you want it to be lovely billowy clouds and that's what I've got here. Spread it over the cake. This is not a sort of decorative cream, it's just a lovely generous smear over the top. And then the maraschino cherries. These are beautiful cherries that are soaked in a maraschino liqueur and they already have the pips out but the best part of these is you must try and get the ones with the stalks which are so pretty. And then these go over the top. And as you can see, there's still a little bit of syrup in the dish. The cake has soaked up most of it. And to finish it off, I've got some beautiful fresh mint from my garden. Just put that there. And if cherries are in season, fresh cherries would be perfect. But I have some wonderful grapes adds a finishing touch to our dessert, the Mexican Trelech cake. I think that looks really good. Well that's dessert done. Next it's beef fajita with guacamole and a wonderful fresh salsa. Then we're going to head off to the braai and I mustn't forget the corn with cheese and chili. Mm -mm, I can't wait. It's Mexican fiesta time today. I've already made the dessert, which is a traditional dish. It's a trailer cake, and I've set that aside. Now I'm going to get onto the beef fajita. Fajita is a traditional Tex-Mex or te Mexican dish of sliced beef that is in a marinade. You need some olive oil, some coriander, cumin, lime or lemon, chili, of course, some tequila, 
garlic and a beautiful piece of beef. Start off with the garlic. Two to four cloves of garlic, whatever takes your fancy. If you want it more garlicky, go with that. Lemon juice. I'm using one lemon. Traditionally used in Mexican dishes. They have a lot of lime, chili, garlic, those kinds of combinations. Okay, throw in the tequila. Don't want to forget that. A good dash of ground cumin, olive oil. All these ingredients go up to make a really good marinade that would tenderize the beef. There's always a bit of chili. Cut the chili, I've got a nice plump red chili here. If you like it really hot, you can leave the seeds in. Just cut it into chunks. It doesn't matter, it can be thick, it's just for the marinade purposes. It goes in there. And then lastly, a little bit of coriander. Chopping it lightly. And there again, it doesn't need to be too fine. A dash of salt and pepper always. Mix those ingredients together. Got lovely aroma. All wonderful ingredients and I can really smell that tequila. Put the marinade in a bag, a plastic bag, because that's the easiest way of marinating this. And then the meat goes in. And that's what makes us so clever doing it this way rather than in a bowl, because you can massage the meat in the bag. Just going to seal it. And this is where you have some fun because you can turn it around and make sure that all the meat is covered in the marinade. Once it's in the fridge, you can do sort of after 15 minutes or an hour, depending how much time you have, you can just turn it around and give it another massage. Mexican food has so many interesting side dishes and I'm going to make two to go with the beef fajita. There's a guacamole with avocado, spring onion, some lemon juice, olive oil and salt and pepper and I'll get to the salsa later. I'll start off by making the avocado guacamole. I've already cut these two little avocados. If you need to find that the pip is quite stubborn, it's good to take a knife and give it a firm thrash. The avocado is scooped into the food processor. Avocados are interesting things. They actually originate in South America where they're classed as a fruit. And you'll find a lot of avocado in South American and particularly Mexican food. Avocado always needs a bit of lemon. It helps with the discoloration and also the flavor. And that lovely citrusy zing that Mexican food is so well known for. To whiz that together very quickly. And being Mexican, you obviously must have a little bit of chili. Just a drop or two of these dried chili flakes. And the spring onion, roughly chopped because it's going to go into the processor with the rest of the ingredients and then process till it's nice and smooth. The onion adds a wonderful flavor to it, but spring onion is not as strong as a normal onion, and I love the green bits, just because it adds such lovely color and texture to your dish. In a dash of salt and pepper. And traditionally there wouldn't be olive oil in, but if you felt it was a little bit thick, I'm going to add some olive oil if the Mexicans will forgive me. The secret to a good guacamole is that chunkiness. So don't blend it till it's completely fine. I have a beautiful bowl to put the guacamole in. I thought it should reflect the colors of Mexico. Another secret to guacamole is that it shouldn't be made too long in advance. But if you can't do it just before it's going to be served, a trick is to leave the avocado pip in the guacamole, which stops the avo going brown too quickly. And to finish it off, a sprig of coriander. The other accompaniment is a salsa. 
In Mexican terms, this would be a sauce, but we know it as a sort of fresh light salad that goes with a dish. I'm using a red sweet onion and some tomato and lemon juice and salt and pepper. It's that simple. Salsas are traditionally made just before they're served and they use the freshest and freshest of ingredients. Never ingredients that have been hanging around for a long time. Slice the onion into small blocks. I prefer the purple onion, mainly because of the wonderful color they provide, but also the sweetness. They're much sweeter than normal onions. And then I've got these beautiful red jam tomatoes. My favorite tomatoes, I love them. Mainly because of the shape, but also I believe they're quite sweet and they add such a lovely flavor to a salsa. Lovely freshness. South African tomatoes can be quite harsh and often need a little bit of sugar with them, but not with these jam tomatoes. It's a very rustic dish, so don't sort of get hung up about cutting it perfectly. So I'm going to squeeze some lemon juice over it. And a good grinding of salt and pepper. Very generous grinding. And just a spoon to mix it all together. Very similar to a sambal. You realize with cooking how many dishes overlap in the world. And that's what I really love about discovering about food. And there we have a lovely fresh salsa to go with our fajita. So all the accompaniments are ready. In a minute or two, we're going to head out to the brine, get that meat on the grill, and don't forget those griddled corn with cheese and chili. Today I'm preparing a Mexican fiesta. This beautiful piece of rump has been marinating for the beef fajitas. The dessert is all ready to go and I just must griddle the corn, a side dish, over the coals. The ingredients for the corn are feta cheese, some mayonnaise, lots of chili, some olive oil, butter and of course some wedges of lime to serve it with. I'm cooking on a coal fire today. I've built up a nice mound of briquettes and I've let them burn down till they're ashy gray. And that's taken me about 30 minutes. And it's now a good idea just to give it a little bit of a shake to spread the coals perfectly. And the mealies go on the fire. Mealies, as we South Africans know it, or corn to the Mexicans, cooks really well over a fire. It gets a lovely sort of smoky flavor to speed up the process and add some lovely flavor to it, I'm going to brush them with some olive oil. The oil will also cause a bit of a flame, which will really get the corn going and give them that lovely smoky flavor. The amount of time the corn takes to cook will depend on the heat of the fire. But as you can see, when they get that lovely glow and have those wonderful brown marks on them, that they're almost ready. But keep an eye on them. To prepare the coating for the mealies, I've got two plates here. One is going to be filled with mayonnaise, with some melted butter poured onto a plate. Makes it easy to actually roll the corn in both. I would say the corn is just about done. They look beautifully well browned <laughs> and have gone a bright yellow, so you know that they're ready. From here, roll them in some butter. The best way of doing it is with two spoons, first into the melted butter, then into some mayo, and then onto the platter. What is so lovely about these mealies is that the butter and the mayonnaise actually helps to keep the juiciness in the mealy and makes it extra succulent, because sometimes corn can be a little dry on the barbecue. To finish it off, a generous sprinkling of feta cheese, it's just crumbled and goes over the top. 
Isn't that looking good? And whilst the mealies are still warm, the feta will melt slightly. And lastly, but not least, a sprinkling of chili over the top. The fire is perfect for the meat. The rump that has been marinated is ready to go on. Use your tongs to get the meat out of the plastic bag. The fire is perfect for the meat. The coals are still chalky gray, but not too intense so it will burn the meat. It's interesting to see how the meat has changed in color. That's from the lemon juice and the tequila that have almost started curing the meat as it marinated. Beef fajita is traditionally served with tortillas, which are those lovely soft flat breads that you will always find in a Mexican meal. I have a beautiful bowl full over here. I like to fold them on a plate, on the serving plate. And the beauty of a beef fajita is that actually a small piece of beef can serve many people because traditionally it would be cut into thin slices and everyone would take one or two slices of beef with the guacamole and the salsa and pile it into a tortilla and that would be sufficient for one person. And then the two side dishes that we made earlier. We have the tomato and onion salsa and the guacamole. Just look at that, the beautiful, vibrant colors of Mexico. And I'm going to just finish it off with a couple of lime wedges. I'm sure this meat is ready to turn. Oh, that's looking so good. Beautifully browned, feels lovely and tender, almost good enough to eat. Oh, cooked perfectly medium rare. I can tell that because the meat has a bit of give in it. If it didn't, you would know that it had been overdone. But this has a lovely bit of give in it. Now the Mexicans would slice this very thinly, so a little goes a long way. Being South Africans, I'm going to slice it into nice little chunks and place it on the board. Oh, that is looking so good, perfectly medium rare. And then again, if you wanted it to be more generous, you could have much thicker slices. Of course, just do what makes you happy. It's perfectly tender, slices really easily, and that's because it had been marinated, and the marinade has done its job. To finish off the platter, with the tortillas and the two side dishes, I've got a board here. There's nothing nicer than a platter of perfectly cooked meat straight off the fire. And to finish it off, some beautiful radishes from my garden. And not forgetting that delicious traditional Mexican pudding I made earlier. Doesn't that look good? All juicy and just ready to be eaten. And a Mexican fiesta would be incomplete without a jug of margarita. I've made a strawberry margarita earlier. Such a beautiful color to add to all the vibrant colors of Mexican food. Finish it off with a strawberry. And there you have it. We've got some perfectly cooked rump for the beef fajitas with a side of salsa and guacamole with the delicious griddled chili cheese corn. And then we've ended off with a Mexican tradition of a trailer cake with condensed milk, ideal milk, and lots of cream. That's it this week for our Mexican fiesta. Join us next time for more great recipes on Summer Sizzle.